times now in Zoom. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. I'm I'm also very honored to be doing this interview as well. So we'll start with the uh, you made your runway comeback with Rahul Mishra's show. How did that happen? It's funny uh, to think of it as a comeback because first of all, I rarely was ever on the runway, even at the peak and the height of my popularity. I was never a runway model, so I can count on my fingers the amount of times that I've been on the runway. But this time will definitely go down as being one of the most memorable experiences. And like so many things in my life, it just sort of came together very organically. Um I met Rahul and Divya at a um at a little retreat vacation in the Himalayas. We went to a place called Sitara. And it was a really dreamy couple of days. It was a small intimate group of us design freaks because I do consider myself a design freak. Um and Sitara started by Anita Lal who is of course behind Good Earth. So hmm, we love mountains collectively and i think we all bonded on that as well as this deep appreciation of nature and i really got to spend some quality time with divya and rahul and you know came out of the experience respecting them and actually quite adoring them even more because rahul is that he is an incredible genius he um his vision and the way that he sees the world is deeply inspiring and and can actually um is something that is really interesting to imbibe and divya of course is a powerhouse and both a creative and a business powerhouse in and of herself but they're just beautiful people so we've kept in touch and uh, sort of out of the blue divya messaged me and she said you know would you be interested in doing this and walking for us and i had to pause because i'm terrified I have to share with you I am completely terrified of walking on the ramp. I'm not a ramp model. Uh I hate heels. Let me put that out there. I very rarely walk in heels these days. I'm a mom after all. I'm running after my kids. I'm in Birkenstocks and chappals these days or bare feet. And you know, there was always that slight hesitation, but then I overcame it because first of all I adore them and but secondly and perhaps most importantly I really respect um the fashion. I think that what Rahul Mishra puts out every single season is exceptional and amongst the best. And the and you know it really and he's also elevated India Indian fashion on a global platform as well showing at you know Paris or Couture Week etc etc. Et So like so many things in my life I overcame my initial fear and hesitation by sort of reflecting and I said yes I'm going to do this. Now the other thing I had to overcome is I was actually scheduled to be at a holistic detox retreat in Kerala called Prakriti Shakti um for 10 days. But to do the show meant that I would have to um cut down the number of days and stay only for 7 days. And I was also willing to do that. So it was a very interesting experience in the sense that I came out of this very transformative very quiet and still and reflective experience and I was tossed straight into the chaos of Couture Week in Delhi you know so to go literally from Kerala for hours outside of Kochi to the middle of fashion in Delhi was also a little bit of a shock for my system but I think I managed to carry the stillness and the peace that i found during my detox retreat and you know it was literally one day of putting everything together one on you know on the same day i landed we did fittings rehearsals and then i walked that evening and it was exhilarating it was really exhilarating i just hoped uh that i acquitted myself well i didn't want to let down rahul and divya that was the only you know the first thing in my mind uppermost in my mind and I didn't want to trip but there was a, such a beautiful unique energy that actually makes me very emotional now when I think about it because I was walking of course to Afreen Afreen and that is a song that I have a complicated relationship with because of course it really in a sense uh elevated my career at that time but also it's a song that 25 maybe 26 years after we filmed the video still in a sense haunts me 
because I have changed and evolved so much from that young girl walking across the sands of Jodhpur to who I am today. I've also, I like to think, accomplished a lot more as well. I have an entire body of work and life experience behind me. So that when somebody constantly identifies me only with Afreen Afreen, and I understand why that happens, I do get a little bit prickly because I guess I get triggered about, in, in the sense that I'm thinking about who I was at that time. And I want people to be able to identify with who I am today. You know, a woman of 52, much more secure in herself and in her body and in her skin. But this was a wonderful opportunity to reclaim some part of myself because to be able to debut after so many years, and I'm going to call it a debut because enough years have passed, to be able to debut on the runway wearing Rahul Mishra, walking to Afreen Afreen has actually, you know, in a sense, I've reclaimed a very different version of myself. And so moving forward, I think I'll have even happier memories of the song. And the audience was wonderful. I was really overwhelmed with their love, their generosity. And you know, you never know because the fashion crowd is a tough crowd. You never know how they're going to react. And there were some whoops and just, I, I mean, I just felt the support beaming off the audience. Amazing. Um, Aliza Milo, speak about your, uh, you were diagnosed with cancer when you were just 37. Yeah. How did Correct. you move forward with that diagnosis? It's such a scary, you know, I mean, I just get, so please tell us. It is, you know, the, the big C still holds a, 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 a lot of fear for many people and I understand that. Having said that, often things that we don't understand that hide in the shadows held a greater grip over us. So cancer and the treatment of cancer has evolved a great deal. And I think that that's very important to put out there that cancer does not necessarily mean uh, death. It doesn't mean a death sentence. There's many, many advancements in treatments. And so we have to start viewing cancer as not even as a single disease or a single diagnosis because there's many different types of cancer with their own kinds of treatments. So having said that, the one that I was treated with, the one that I was diagnosed with is fairly dire and considered incurable and also considered fatal. However, we have seen a great deal of progress. So how did I handle it? I mean, I think I really tapped into inner reserves. You know, I have been a meditator and someone who practices yoga for many, many years and very quietly as well. It's not something that I talk about very commonly. And I think that it's equipped me with these incredible reserves of resilience and strength, but also perspective, also a unique way of being able to reframe my experience from, oh my God, this is horrible, why me, to what do I have to learn from this? What is my body telling me? And what is the universe trying to teach me as well? And so, you know, it's a journey that had its fair share of ups and downs and it wasn't easy and of course I've written about it in my book Close to the Bone that is very close to my heart as well because I only ever wanted to be a writer. But moving forward, it's incredible because in a strange way, I have to say that coming out at the other end of it, cancer really liberated me from a lot of hang-ups, it liberated me from a lot of baggage, my past and traumas, because it really gives you a sense of urgency about life. Life is here and now. Life is not about dwelling on what happened or what might happen. It's about this present moment. And that's what many masters try to teach us as well about life, is that don't worry, the, the, you know, the future doesn't exist, the past also doesn't exist, so why are you wasting this moment? This is all you have and this is precious. And it really refocused me and drastically changed my entire perspective on life. So that life has become a lot easier since then. In a strange way, even though I'm still living with this disease, I still take treatment, I still go for my blood work and checkups. But I'm very blessed to have had the support of also so many people when I chose to share my diagnosis publicly. And I do think that I was the first Indian personality or well-known Indian celebrity to share 
a diagnosis of cancer publicly. That was back in 2009. And I didn't do it with any sort of agenda. I did it because I was very confused about the way forward. And I also felt, why should I feel any sense of shame about this? Maybe I need help, I need support, and maybe if I speak about it publicly, it will help me and help others. So I started a blog called The Yellow Diaries. I never thought about writing a blog, but writing is my go-to mode of expression. More than acting or performing or anything else, I, I'm, I like to think I'm a born writer. And so I chronicled my disease and that opened the floodgates of people talking about it, of support, but also it was very deeply therapeutic for me. It was a catharsis because I also am someone who believes in following a path of no BS, of being very frank and forward and authentic. And for much of my life, I had to hide that, that version of myself. It wasn't convenient to the narrative that India you know, made up about me, that she's a glamour puss and that she's very inaccessible and that she's, you know what I mean, very untouchable almost and aspirational. Whereas I'm like everyone else, I'm very down to earth. I have exactly the same troubles and traumas and, you know, my feet are firmly on the ground. So it was a breakthrough moment because I was able to share so much of myself. And I really think that that also helped with my healing. It helped me let go of a lot that I had been holding on to. So the writing proved to be very cathartic. The support from going public, and in fact, I announced my diagnosis on the red carpet at the, the Toronto Carpenter International Film Festival. Festival. Yeah. Yes, and that was also, I, I'm not sure whether anyone has ever done that. <laughs> and, you know, it also opened up a new sense of purpose in my life. And so ever since then, and it's been some time now, I still, like to think that I dedicate myself to opening the conversation about cancer, demystifying cancer, taking away the fear as much as I can, trying to be frank, trying to be supportive. I do a lot of public speaking still to this day, inaugurating cancer wards, speaking to other people, making myself available. It's essential, but it doesn't make me, it doesn't mean I'm a great person, I'm literally paying it forward from all the support that I received when I was going through it that, it, that I will never forget until my last day. The generosity of spirit that I experienced from nurses, from other cancer survivors. And when I asked them, how can I repay you? They literally said, just pay it forward. And I take that very seriously. So paying it forward and living with a newfound vitality really paying attention to my health in a way that I didn't before cancer. And ironically, I'm healthier than I ever have before. I ever have been before at the age of 52, even though I'm living with an incurable disease, because now I practice self-love and prioritize my health in a way that I never did when I was young. I really abused my health, I think. And I think we all sort of go through that, honestly, in our 20s and it's okay. I don't judge myself for it. But it took me some time to get here. And um, and ironically, <clears throat> post-cancer, and I know that this sort of, in a sense, my narrative and my story <clears throat> goes against what a lot of people feel that cancer is. But post-cancer, I got married. I found the love of my life. I got married. I had children. I rebooted my career. I wrote a book and I live a very purposeful, healthy, grounded life. And, you know, if you had told me at 30, I would have said, no, not possible. I was living a very different kind of life. So that's the irony is that cancer opened a new gateway for me, but I chose to pay attention and try to extract the lessons from being diagnosed with cancer. Even though I had deep, dark days, and I'm not saying that I wasn't fearful, but I chose to put that into practice and I chose to always bring more light to the situation rather than darkness. What would you do when you were very low and those dark days would haunt you? How would you get out of it? I would, you know, honestly, sometimes it meant just watching films, you know, doing, you know, writing, of course, was always my go-to, reading and writing. Sometimes you need a light moment. Sometimes you need the presence of a friend, somebody that you're really close to. But by presence, I mean, I didn't want advice. I didn't want to sit and talk about my disease. I wanted to talk about normal things of those days, you know, or just 
sit around and not talk about anything or talk about them. So, you know, those were some of the techniques that I used. I mean, of course, I had low energy, so I wasn't able to do a lot of the things that I enjoy doing, like walking or working out or yoga or things like that. That wasn't even accessible to me really in the middle of treatment. But having said that, I really think that also, you know, reaching out also to people, as I said, the unconditional support that I felt from strangers also really, really kept me going. And um, you would say you've become very spiritual now or were you always inclined towards spirituality? There's this line in your book, live your life like a lotus, right? So I would yeah. like to know more about this. Yes, it's very important to me. And if I could lift my ankle up, I would show you my lotus tattoo that I got very soon after that. Uh, it's quite extravagant. <laughs> it's not like a little lotus, it's very big. Um, so when I was working on a film called Water, that I feel is one of my best pro professional experiences, I was playing a character that at one point recited the shlok, a very simple one, Padma Patram Evam Bhasan. It means live your life like the lotus flower and it always stayed with me. And in fact, this line was uttered in response to another character and that was played by John Abraham asking my character, how can you bear your life? Your life is so tragic and, you know, and and terrible, how do you bear it? And she said, Padma Patram Evam Bhasa and live your, I'm living my life like the lotus, which means floating on the surface, you know, being a, a sense of detachment as well and not allowing the mud that is stirred up to stick to you. So yeah, I always went back to that. That's sort of the symbolism of the lotus. And I really imbibed that ever since my character had to utter that. And I've made it sort of a life mantra, you could say. And, and it's still with me today. And that's why I got the tattoo as well. And tell us how did becoming a mother change your life? It's I mean, ongoing. The Let me just say that. Um, honestly, it's, it's, I know other people have said it and I'm not necessarily going to be able to put it in better words than someone else, but it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And it's the most challenging, it's the most confronting thing that's ever happened to me as well. So tell us about your daughters being a mother and how oh, I yeah, so, so, yeah, motherhood is utterly transformative. But having said that, I want to put something out there that it didn't come to me naturally. I never craved or longed to be a mother oh. until a certain point in my life. And that was also post-cancer and I guess maybe finding really my life partner. And then things started changing. And my children were born via surrogacy because of course, for a number of reasons, um, I felt I was probably on the slightly older side to carry them, but I couldn't technically carry them because of the medication I'm on. So we did turn to surrogacy and I'm very grateful for it. Um, but it took me, I would say, a good year and a half before I was truly bonded with my children. And that's something that maybe we don't discuss enough as mothers. It's hard to become a mother. Yes, you can say a mother is born when your children are born. But the emotional journey that you have to go through is not necessarily that immediate. The bonding can take a while. And that was my experience. But, you know, now that my children are six years old, I'm obsessed. And to be honest, I wasn't in the beginning. I was frightened. I was overwhelmed. I didn't know how to do anything because I had no experience with children as well. I kind of didn't really like children to begin with until I had my own. Now I smile and wave at children before I was like, oh, sticky fingers, stay away from me. <laughs> you know, so, um, <clears throat> but my children, I call them lion princesses. They are strong opinionated, talented, they're singing and dancing and confident and I see like such a beautiful shining future for them. Um, and I feel that this generation, they're alphas I guess, they're the alpha generation and alpha is a good word for it because um, this generation I think is almost, you know, they're, they're I don't want to say programmed or conditioned, but they come out of the womb ready to take on the world and ready to absorb a lot more than I did in my generation. I feel that they are, 
I don't know, a decade or two decades ahead of where I was at their age in terms of their comprehension of everything. And it's beautiful to see. Mind you, look, I, I have suddenly become my mother. I do try to impose discipline. I subscribe to gentle parenting, but mixed with discipline because you know, children need structure. They actually need discipline. I, you know, before I, before they were born, I had this very idealistic version of what it would be like. Like we'd be floating around the garden, picking flowers all day long and wearing white linen dresses. And that would be motherhood. Seriously. <laughs> I look at it now and I'm like, no, you know, motherhood is messy. There's so many beautiful, precious moments, but it's messy and you have to accept that. And it's kind of also helped me loosen my control issues like around the house and around, don't touch that, don't do this. So they helped me grow. I've grown through my children. They're my little teachers, they're my little masters. But my one biggest issue and my only anxiety today is um, tech is them being digital natives. I'm very anxious about the amount of tech that they're exposed to. And I've actually changed schools right now because I was very unhappy with their previous school using an iPad constantly to teach math and no workbooks. And that's really disturbing to me. Um, so I think that for me, looking forward, would be one of the biggest challenges, um, you know, in parenting and try to, trying to keep them off of smartphones, off of iPads, and um, I mean, social media can, and we're seeing it, will lead to a lot of mental health issues for young women. So I'm trying to be very vigilant about it as much as I can. Do you refer to any parenting books to, or you're doing it on your own with whatever you feel is good? For no, them? there's no, no. You know, I I don't believe in the the you know book parenting. Um, most of the books that I've read are not don't resonate with me. Although there's one book I'm reading, which is called I, iPad or iPad. Sorry, it's by Neha, Neha Hiranandani. Okay. And it's really good. It's about the digital, like this generation. And it's humorous as well. I've been referring to that because the conversations are already quite hilarious. Mama, when can we watch? Because they're only allowed to watch once a week. And they start asking on Monday and they can only watch on Sunday. So... <laughs> um, I joined a movement called the Smartphone Movement. It's an international movement as well, where parents have conversations about alternatives to smartphones, uh, parental controls, and also, you know, alternatives to the iPad and screen time. And this is something I feel super, super strongly about because the evidence is out there that this younger generation, if the overexposure to tech at too young an age leads to a plethora of issues and also robs our kids of their innocence as well you know they really should be outdoors playing so um yeah so that's the one thing that i'm quite dogmatic you might say about right now what would you uh, tell your younger self today because you've changed a lot you've you've said that yourself <laughs> And that would dramatically just... change. You know, people who have known me and, you know, when I go back, I mean, I'm a Bombay girl, even though I'm from Calcutta, but I'm, you know, Bombay is the city that I always say made me, broke me, remade me. Um, <clears throat> so every time we go back, we have a home there. So we're back and forth between Mumbai and Dubai. Um, and I meet my old friends. I mean, some of them, some of them, I mean, they'll always be precious to me, but we have no... I mean, we have very little to talk about because who I am today has evolved so much. And some of them can't believe who I am today. And then some have also evolved in a similar direction as me. So it's interesting to reflect on those bonds. But um, what would I tell my younger self? I'd say don't take things so seriously. Sorry, what? Just Just, and don't, don't take things so seriously, yaar. <laughs> Just lighten up, yaar. I was very dark. <laughs> I took things way too seriously when I was younger. But also I would tell myself to be kinder to myself as well. You okay. know, not, not, it's not, it wasn't so much about what the world was saying. It was about my own internal dialogue and what I was saying. 
about myself. I was so self-critical, incredibly so. And you know, you have this, you know, it's wonderful, it's a beautiful privilege to get older and reflect and look back at pictures of yourself when you were, say, 17, 18, 19, 20. And you look at yourself and you're like, damn, I was so pretty and beautiful. And, you know, I radiated this, this innocence, but, remembering if you recall who you were at that moment you probably looked at yourself in the mirror and saw a million flaws right and that's something that i would love to tell women of today you know just love yourself just love yourself you are precious as you are and fortunately you know beauty standards are kind of evolving i mean there's two things going on right now there's the unrealistic digital beauty standards that are highly toxic and that we have to talk about but then also there's an expansion of the definition of beauty as well going on a lot more conversations about you know inclusiveness and plus sizes and and skin tones and stuff like that and i feel that i'm very very encouraged by that uh one more question uh just tell us about your book close to the bone and how did you just like come up with wanting to write it well i only ever wanted to be a writer Oh, nothing else. And, you know, and I am working on another book and, you know, that's all I want to do right now. Uh, I want to sprinkle in a little bit more of doing, you know, walking the runway for Raul Mishra and doing four more shots, please, and things like that. That's lovely. But my main focus is writing and my family and cancer advocacy. And in a weird way, uh, writing close to the bone brought all of that together because I had to reflect on my heritage, my origins, write about my family history, because you have to see where you were in order to see where you're going. Um, I fulfilled my desire to write a book. It was a hell of a journey. Um, and, you know, I was able to also position it from a sense of, you know, cancer advocacy is, you know, hopefully someone can reach out to the book and look at the last few chapters and read about my journey and I would hope that you know they would be able to find something that might help them in that. So I was able to combine all of my passions but I'm a lifelong reader I still believe in books I still believe that you know books poetry reading is essential. These are like the notes they're the musical notes of our life and you know the symphony is simply not complete without them. Is there anything else, Lisa, you would like to tell us today for the... I don't know. I mean, I just want to share that I feel that, you know, uh, life is um, absolutely amazing. And what I've learned, though, is to invest in myself from the point of view of understanding my natural rhythm is slow, slowing down. And I've never been so happy and so mindful and conscious of the little moments in life. So hashtag slow living. I'm an advocate and an evangelist for that and slow traveling for that matter. I've been a lifelong nomad and I've actually been enjoying traveling less but traveling deeper. And I think that goes for life as well. Do less but do it deeper. And life for me now is about the direction that you're going in, not how fast you're getting there. Great. It was lovely talking to you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank and I so really much. enjoyed this conversation as well. Same here. Thank you. Such an honor to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.